go ahead and call this meeting to order. Okay. Um, if I could ask Danny Allman to yeah. lead us in our invocation. Yes, let us play. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for a beautiful day, our great city and state and our great country that we all are privileged to live in. Please guide us as we do the people's business today and help us make the correct decisions. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Danny. All right, item number one on the, uh, the agenda today is the Visitors and Citizens Forum. Any citizen with business not scheduled on the agenda may speak to the Economic Improvement Corporation. No deliberation or action can be taken on these items because the Open Meetings Act requires an item be posted on an agenda 72 hours before the meeting. Visitors are asked to limit their presentations to three minutes. I don't have any cards. Do we have any citizens that would wish to speak? All right, I see none. So we'll move on to item number two, uh, 2A, which are our monthly financials for January of 2020. Uh, Ms. Dozier. Good afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm going to be talking to you about um, the financial statements for the month ended January 31st. And uh, we'll be going through some items that are in your packet and putting them up on the screen here. We're going to start with the statement of activities for the month. And I'm primarily looking at um, the second column over called current period. Um, so in the month of January, EIC received sales tax of 292,000. Um, that was up significantly from January of the previous year, but there was kind of an anomaly going on in the previous year with the prepayment. So I think it's better to look at things on a year to date basis, but on a year to date basis, um, sales tax is up 5.18% um, this year compared to last year, so very healthy. Um, we're continuing to see strong performance in retail and food services, and those are our two largest categories, so very, very good to see strong performance in those two large categories. Um, in addition, one thing that I wanted to note is that we are also seeing um, some new sales tax coming in related to internet sales. I don't know if you've seen some things in the news about that recently, but um, there was a decision back in 2018 by the Supreme Court called South Dakota versus Wayfair um, that said that, you know, you used to be able to buy things online without paying sales tax in some situations. Um, now that's not the case anymore. And in particular, we're starting to see some of these marketplace sellers like you know, when you buy something on Amazon that's not from Amazon LLC, but from one of their marketplace sellers, now you're charged tax when you buy from those providers. Um, and we're starting to see that sales tax revenue come to us now because it's based on where your goods get delivered. So people who are ordering things online and having them delivered to Kerrville, um, we're seeing some of that internet. Is this sales the first time you've received those funds? We started receiving them in October. Um, so. Um, but it's starting to amount to, we're seeing growth. So about how in much it. is that? Um, we've seen about um, 24000 since um, October. Found um, money. So, yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, so we'll take it. Um, and also on the um, looking forward, um, you know, sales tax is received um, two months after the fact. So, in February, on Friday of last week, we received sales tax for sales that actually happened in December. I'm happy to report that um, that was our largest month of sales tax that we've ever received um, for the city of Kerrville, um, up 4.7%. So more to come on that next month, but we continue to see real strong sales tax performance. And in March, that's um, when we should start seeing receipts from Hobby Lobby and um, Harbor Freight um, since they were open that last week of January. Um, we should see some sales tax coming in from them starting in March. So, so good news um, on the sales tax. And then moving down into expenses, um, we just had some kind of regularly occurring things on the expense side. There was um, the monthly payments for debt and, um, and administrative services. And then we also had a quarterly payment to KEDC of 62500 And just one thing to note, in the last week, we've received funding requests from Arcadia and also an initial funding request from the airport. So we're in the process of, um, of verifying those funding requests. Um, but those are ones that were expected in this quarter. So we are starting to see those come in. 
So um, following this activity, I'm going to move on to the cash flow statement. Um, EIC ended the month of January with a cash balance of $1,924,000. Um, this is just our cash flow forecast that we continue to look at each month, and it's staying pretty similar. Next month, I'll add on another quarter out into fiscal year 21. Um, but we're continuing to see a low balance projected in this quarter of 1.3 million, and that would be after funding is released for the Arcadia project, and if we get some Thompson a request in from Thompson Drive Partners, and EA will give some updates on those projects. Um, we continue to have the EIC funds invested in text pool, completely liquid municipal pool account, um, currently earning 1.77 percent. Interest rates have stabilized, not exactly at a high level, but um, anyway, they appear to be pretty stable at this point. On that point, <clears throat> I noticed on the income statement that when I annualize the uh, interest income, there's either our balances are smaller or we've missed the mark on our budget because we're five or six thousand dollars short annualized. Is, is, is it interest rate that's causing that or is yeah, it balances? We, the, um, because, you know, we were setting our budget back last June, and um, we were using 2.25 um, as okay. our estimated interest rate. Um, so um, we may make up a little bit of that, just depending on the timing of our um, payments on different large projects um, may keep us um, with money a little longer than what we had initially planned. Um, but, yes, we were using a higher interest okay. rate in our budget um, assumptions. And um, also, um, let's see, well, I'll go to one more page. So then the third page of your report shows um, just a financial analysis. Um, you can see the projects that are remaining um, that EIC has funding agreements for but has not made all the payments on. Um, and then you can see a little bit more detail analysis on the sales tax revenue and the investments. Um, and then also attached to your report um, are as a quarterly report from James Avery and a monthly report um, from Fox Tank. And they um, both companies are meeting uh, the requirements uh, that they have in their uh, contracts with EIC. And that's all that I have. Any questions? All right. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Okay, moving on to item 2B, which is a projects update. Mr. Hoppy. Good afternoon, EIC. Um, my pleasure to provide an update on 11 projects that you guys have authorized uh, to catalyze economic activity out in the community. Uh, first of all, River Trail Extension at Shrine University, uh, continuing to progress very nicely out there. We have had some rain activity, uh, thankfully, here over the last month, but not great for construction projects. So uh, we're they're out there pouring when they can pour, uh, but you know it's uh, we'll, we'll see how that shapes out. We're still looking at April, uh, May time frame uh, as far as uh, hopefully being able to open up that extension. Uh, plans on the uh, actual trailhead uh, going very well. Um, you know, Shriner University is doing all of those private improvements on, on their side of it. They're continuing to progress that construction project. They have completed uh, their uh, granite, uh, little right, right around two miles of granite perimeter trail around their campus. So we're excited to see that. And now we're starting to see a lot of focus right there at the actual trailhead. So keep you posted on that uh, as the <coughs> so spring what, and the weather progresses. What progress. phase are you, about halfway through, you think? or? Mm, I would say, uh, you know, we've, we've been, done all the land clearing uh, mm -hmm. as far as pouring uh, actual concrete. We're maybe a quarter of the way through. Quarter. <coughs> Tennis center improvements, uh, really same story. Uh, had a little bit of weather delays, uh, but we are uh, making significant progress there. We're hoping that that will be um, fully and completely open by the end of March. Uh, we may have a partial opening to accommodate uh, some tournaments that we have scheduled. We don't want to miss those if we can. We've got a UIL tournament and a couple others that, that we want to try to squeeze in, uh, mostly landscaping uh, that won't be fully installed at that time. So we feel like we can rope that off and make sure it's safe uh, and open it up, at least for those tournaments, because we, we definitely want to highlight uh, the new facility uh, to those tournaments if we can. So 
aquatic feasibility study. Uh, we have uh, wrapped that up and uh, we will be uh, bringing that to the parks board as well as our other uh, stakeholders and uh, policy givers, uh, including this group in the March timeframe. So we are looking for a good date to be able to have kind of a community uh, follow up uh, meeting on that. Uh, that uh, uh, consulting group was able to give us uh, basically several tiers uh, of improvements based off the community feedback uh, and budgets. Um, and so we'll be able to present that information to you all at that time. We'll keep you posted on a date. Olympic Drive Infrastructure Extension, um, that contract has been let and is about to uh, start. They have uh, begun to mobilize, as you know, a lot of construction going on just next door uh, at the middle school site. Uh, there at the, what will be the new Hal Peterson, um, but uh, a, a similar contractor, actually one of the subs working on that, also bid on that project. So uh, they'll be uh, just kind of moving moving onto the street, not across the street, but onto the street uh, and, and creating that utility infrastructure work for us. So excited to get that one going. Uh, we're working with closely uh, with TxDOT as well. Uh, and then we actually were able to present uh, some of the pedestrian and uh, bicycle improvements to uh, the local KISD uh, robotics club that was interested in that topic uh, towards the, the fall and winter time frame. So they actually came through. We did a little workshop for uh, them and council here uh, just recently. So excited to be able to bring that uh, multi-use uh, path and extension uh, across that <coughs> corridor. Uh, downtown uh, Streetscape parking garage, we did receive bids last week. We are sorting through those right now uh, and uh, uh, ascertaining exactly where that project is uh, moving forward. Uh, Legion lift station, uh, very close to completion on that, waiting on a few more additional pieces of equipment uh, so we can fully uh, mobilize that project here over the next uh, 30 to 60 days. Uh, aerial pipe bridge, uh, we are wrapping up uh, the forensic uh, engineering analysis on that project, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, bring that to uh, some degree of conclusion uh, here in the near future. Um, we have gotten the first million again on the Texas Water Development Board Disaster Recovery Funds. We have made application for the additional half million dollars uh, to be able to put that infrastructure up onto the Loop 534 bridge. We're hopeful that we'll know uh, that uh, whether we were going to receive that additional half million uh, by about the May, June timeframe, which actually syncs up very nicely with when we will be wrapping up the engineering efforts in that project. Hobby Lobby is open. Uh, those cash registers are rolling. Uh, and that O'Connell Lodge Hotel has been demolished. So success, we will probably go ahead and pull this one off uh, for you guys next month. Uh, we're excited here in the next couple months. You know, there's always a two month lag in sales tax collections for when we see that coming in, but we're excited to see, uh, it's been quite a lot of cars coming out of that parking lot uh, here in the last couple months. So excited to see that. Uh, Thompson Spur 98 infrastructure extension, uh, the vast majority of the offsite improvements uh, have been completed, which is the portion that EIC helped incentivize uh, to be able to make that utility infrastructure extension across that entirety of that 98 uh, corridor. Uh, a lot of work going on there uh, at the landing. Uh, we're starting to see, as you recall, there was a big component of that was the multifamily uh, piece of it. Um, the vast majority of those slabs for that multifamily piece have been poured, and so I think we're going to begin to see some vertical uh, construction here in the next 30 to 60 days. Arcadia Theater, uh, lots of great construction progress. Uh, as Amy mentioned uh, a, a minute ago, uh, that uh, uh, construction contract has been let by that private uh, nonprofit developer, uh, and uh, construction is uh, uh, moving along. Uh, they continue to be hopeful. Uh, to be open by the July 3rd timeframe. I had a, a large presentation at the economic uh, summit uh, last week, and so we're excited uh, for them and, and the rapid progress that we'll be making here in the next four, five, six months. Uh, and last, but certainly not least, Kerrville Airport Improvements. Um, Ms. Mary Rohr, the manager at the airport, is continuing to progress a number of projects out there, including uh, the box hangers that are in conjunction, not incentivized by, but in conjunction with the T-Hanger project, which was leveraged through TxDOT funds. And then certainly uh, we are uh, making great progress on the horseshoe building uh, and the demolition and subsequent plans for uh, reinvigorating and bringing something up out of the ground on that project. We'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions? No. A lot of good work. None. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ian. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> All right, item 2C, which is our monthly update from Kerr Economic Development Corporation. Mr. Salinas? 
Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, um, I'll have a, a brief uh, report on uh, one of our projects, and then I'm going to be talking about the uh, economic summit and how we hosted some of the uh, some the delegation, some visitors at the event. As far as SkyMaster, there's no uh, major uh, update at this time. Uh, we are getting ready to see if they're going to be coming back for another site visit, specifically looking at the building uh, or facilities uh, that we're proposing at, at the moment. We are looking at uh, several incentive scenarios. Uh, and again, uh, please keep in mind that there is competition for this particular project. There's two cities that are making a very hard run for it. So right now, we find ourselves really just in a three-way conversation with uh, the state of Texas, the prospect, and ourselves facilitating those discussions to see where we're going to be going with the project and ultimately how to close that particular deal. As far as the uh, economic summit, um, we, had, uh, we hosted a Texas Workforce Commissioner, Julian Alvarez. Him and uh, his staff, he brought in the executive director for employer initiatives, which is basically the one that heads up uh, the workforce commission at the state level. Also the uh, vice president uh, of economic development uh, for Alamo Colleges in San Antonio, and then the regional representative for the skills development fund. So basically the person that oversees that fund as it pertains to this particular region. They were in our community, they were at the summit. Uh, the uh, workforce commissioner presented at the summit. He was there for uh, our part of the presentation, and he went up there and presented as well. And then after that, uh, we had a conference call with one of our prospects. In this case, it was uh, Project SkyMaster. Again, just kind of looking at how it is that we're gonna start pulling this deal together, and really instilling, instilling a level of confidence for the prospect as it pertains to the state. You know, the state is here to work with us and uh, with this project. After that, uh, we toured the uh, Tyvee uh, High School with uh, Dr. Faust, uh, the different uh, trades programs. That w went very, very well. Commissioner uh, certainly enjoyed that and started looking at some opportunities as far as partnering uh, with uh, the, the school district as well as the state. Also, we had a, a roundtable discussion with our stakeholders, so we camped uh, the day with that. Uh, and uh, some of you all were there for that particular discussion. Going back to the, sum uh, to the summit, um, he spoke at the event and he emphasized the need for creating programs really because of our unemployment rate at 2.8%, uh, kind of looking to start thinking outside the box. So what is it that we can do? So one of the things that he said specifically at the summit was looking at a particular program where it's kind of like a second opportunity uh, for individuals in the community to start coming in and working with some of these companies. And again, it's just looking at how can we now really start working, getting people to work that perhaps would not be hired through conventional means. And again, this just goes back to the very low unemployment rate that we have in the area. Also at the event, uh, they were very happy in the sense that uh, the Workforce Commission and their group, they picked up a couple of leads. So as a result of being at the summit presenting, um, I think they're gonna start working with all plastics already, looking at developing a particular program for them. And then there's another company that they're looking to work with as well now. That's the whole gist of it, right? Having the state coming in, looking at our level of activity, meeting some of our local companies, and in turn start developing a pipeline of funds from the state to help our local companies. Um, the one thing that he did say that was very interesting was uh, he commended our community for hosting this particular event. Uh, he said, look, you know, the, the, the number of people we had at the event and some of the stakeholders, this is what you see in some of the larger cities. He said, so definitely for a community your size, you guys are definitely... Uh, doing something that's very good for your local industry. Coming back to the roundtable discussion that we had at our office, we had a cross-section of uh, some of our stakeholders. And when I say stakeholders, are those that are involved with the EDC. That was uh, the EIC, the city, the county, the K-Pub, and then uh, the staff as well. The intent was to have an open uh, dialogue with the Workforce Commission and uh, their staff as well, uh, looking at the, some of the community challenges and identifying some of the gaps. Um, generated some good ideas and uh, some action items came, came out of it. There was an interesting question that was asked by one of the stakeholders who was asking, well, who's going to be doing this particular work and what is it that we need to do? And his response is, you're doing it now. Uh, having the different entities and the stakeholders at the table, that's exactly what the state wants to see and that's exactly what a prospect wants to see when they're coming to a particular community. So basically this is your power base and this is how you're going to get uh, deals done. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, him coming in and visiting Kerrville, our objective really was for him to come in and get a feel for our community, for the level of activity that's going on already, meeting with the different entities uh, and then looking at different opportunities and already there's there's one that's or at least a couple of them that, that are in the pipeline. 
identifying the gaps, getting him in front of our prospect as well via a conference call. Uh, and again, just showing to our prospect, hey, look, you know, the state is here, the Texas Workforce Commissioner, who's a person that's very hard to get a hold of, is coming in here and already pledging support for the project. So again, the end game is developing that pipeline of funds now, importing money into our community, into our local industry. Uh, so now, city manager, myself, Walt, and Teresa, we've got a list of action items that have resulted as a result of his uh, meeting, him coming in, and we've got some homework. Another one of the visitors that we had uh, with the Economic Summit was uh, Tom Long. He is the number two person for the San Antonio Economic Development Foundation, which is basically the economic development group for San Antonio. He's very highly regarded in the field nationally. Um, so it was a great opportunity for him to come in, kind of like us hosting our big brother to the east. Uh, he was definitely asking about, uh, you know, what's happening in our community, but specifically about drive times to San Antonio, to certain parts of San Antonio supply chain and what have you. Um, if you look at a Seguin and a San Marcos, they are a little bit closer than we are to San Antonio, but they have benefited significantly uh, by landing suppliers, you know, for uh, that industry that's in San Antonio. So again, there's an opportunity for us there, and I'm not saying that we're gonna land a string of these companies, but if we just get a little, little piece of that pie of what's happening in San Antonio, and that's our opportunity to start growing it from there. Um, some other visitors that we had along the lines of regionalism, uh, we invited the uh, executive directors and for uh, the economic development organizations for Fredericksburg, Bernie, and Junction, and a few other communities, but those three were, were in attendance and were sitting at our table. Uh, so they were, one, thankful that we hadn't invited them, but the other thing was that we told them that uh, first and foremost, we're not gonna be strangers. So this is the start of us now really starting to work together. I said, so uh, we're definitely not gonna be reaching out and making it a point to start meeting on a quarterly basis to see what's happening in our respective backyards uh, and ultimately how we can help. So again, the summit uh, helped us in many different ways in bringing in people into our community and then us doing our part to really take advantage, full advantage of that and open it up. That concludes the part of my report. The reason to be coming in and coming, uh, talking about a uh, partnership that we have with the Office of the Governor and an event that we're going to be hosting next month. Are there any questions? I don't hear any. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Slinks. All right, Slinks. thank you. <coughs> Welcome, Teresa. Hi, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so as Mr. Salinas was saying, we are hosting the uh, one of three Central Texas Small Business Series for the Office of the Governor um, that is slated for March 26th. Uh, our location here in Kerrville is still to be determined, but we will keep you updated as we receive more information on that. Um, currently, we do have several panelists in place, uh, but we are still looking for opportunities within the community to have more panelists and um, bringing in more regional support uh, throughout the community as well as our again our county um, our county participants that we invited uh, to the economic summit so Bernie Junction Fredericksburg um, since this is a central Texas small business series we are inviting again regional and participants from around the area to participate so we would like to see small businesses represented from the central Texas region uh, not just Kerrville so um, we've reached out to, again, small businesses um, outside of our area to be panelists. And so there will also be state regional um, support for those businesses where they'll be able to receive information. Uh, the attendees will be able to see, receive information on how they can fund their businesses, how they can um, receive legal support or information on um, assistance with workforce. So a big, a big part of that will also be representation again from the Texas Workforce Commission. Um, so excellent opportunity for um, not only our, again, our local businesses and uh, our local resources to be involved, but again, um, our region as well. Um, also just very briefly, briefly I know I, I spoke about uh, Texas Railing Systems in the Economic Summit, um, but they are looking to expand in the future. Um, not slated for a specific time period, uh, but 
um, the design portion or phase of that expansion has already been completed. Um, Wayne Uger is looking uh, right now at the funding portion of that expansion. Um, he is only within the county area, so that's not something that will come before the EIC, but I do believe it's important for everybody within the community to know about that expansion project. So he's looking to expand 3,600 square feet. 3,000 of that will be manufacturing and 600 will be office space. And again, looking to increase his workforce by about 10 employees. That's all I have for today. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. <clears throat> all right. Does that conclude our KEDC report? Yeah, we are concluded. Thank you very much. All right, we will move on then to uh, item three in our agenda, and 3A, which is an EIC funding request for improvements to the Dual School Community Center located at the intersection of Pascal Avenue and West Barnett Street. Mr. Hoppy, will this be you starting off? I'm just going to provide a quick introduction. <clears throat> so we did receive uh, an application um, from the Doyle School Community Center uh, Board of Directors uh, here at uh, the end of January timeframe. Uh, we were able to pull together a GO Team meeting uh, last week after reviewing the application. Staff reviewed the application, deemed it to be complete. GO Team reviewed it. Uh, and uh, approved it to move forward uh, before you tonight. We do have uh, Ms. Kay talley uh, the Board of Directors, uh, to present the application to you today. Very good. Welcome. Thank you. I really do appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to you about this very important proposal. Um, the, I have a, some slides, but I also have some explanation to, to, about the proposal and about what's been happening in the Doyle, um, Doyle area. The, the Doyle School Community Center really just has a very short history compared to the history of the Doyle School. Um, but they share still that they share one key characteristics. They both were and are the hub of the Doyle community. Doyle continues to be the place to gather for important events, whether it is using space for a child's birthday party, gathering 150 people of your closest friends and neighbors to see Santa or prepare for the school year. People depend on Doyle for a lot of things. Early in the 2000s, partners and ministry supported an effort to survey the Doyle area residents to assess the perceived <coughs> needs of that community. What they found was that the Doyle, even though it had been um, very, a lot of different types of schools since, it, since integration, that it was still perceived to be a good central part of the uh, piece of the neighborhood. Uh, the, the residents told partners in ministry that they thought it would be important to continue to have Doyle <coughs> and have them uh, have Doyle to provide large gatherings, senior luncheons, health care, outreach, and children's programs. Fortunately, the Calo Foundation stepped in and, and purchased the property while a four, uh, 501c3 was being uh, formed to, to, to run the center. That was in the early 2000s, and the first few years were just were quite dynamic there because of a a partnership with the, the school district of a mentoring grant that was through the Department of Education. Um, and things were going very well with ample funding until the Croc Center project came in. Uh, when, the, when the Croc Center was initiated, there became, had some confusion concerning what the Doyle's niche would be in the community. Um, there was some funding, there was a funding crisis and really an identity crisis for Doyle. Uh, a lot of boards would have folded up their tent and gone home, but this board did not. They sought <clears throat> many different projects and partnerships, didn't have any luck. They decided to limit their scope to quarterly meetings, collaborations for occasional programs, such as Any Baby Can, Boys and Girl Scouts. And at one point we had um, uh, Any Baby, I mean, sorry, Art to Heart, and then the um, Youth Build program in there. Um, when that, when those left. Um, it's, we were still trying to work to find our niche. The, school, the board was still very, very firm in their, in their uh, commitment to having the Doyle Center be a viable entity. So to do that, the board has always been a working board in the truest sense. We've always been planning, setting up for, executing, and cleaning up from the many gatherings each year. There have been dozens of cookies baked, hot dogs cooked, and bottles of water handed out by the board volunteers and other important volunteers that serve a well over a thousand people each year. So we find that the Doyle is only a, vi is a viable center in 2020 only because of, group, of 
people continued to provide services, write grant requests, fix toilets, sweep floors, and prepare meals, all for the good of the people in the neighborhood. Partners such as First United Methodist Church, St. Peter's Methodist Church, K-Star, the Public Library, and many others have ensured that the services still continue through the Doyle. Um, in the past few years, we've continued to get support from the Peterson Foundation, and a part-time facility manager has stabilized their program delivery and upkeep. Um, but we do have typical aging issues with the facility, such as a failing HVAC system, but the building itself is in good, is in good shape. Recently, Doyle has been fortunate to become partners with Shriner University, whose students have enabled Doyle to, to, to build a thriving after-school kids club, several great evening programs for families, and uh, the nursing students have gathered some valuable data about the neighborhood and the, for, for public health. The Neighborhood Development Plan, in cl collaboration with the City of Kerrville, has brought the stakeholders and citizens together to plan for revitalization of a neighborhood that has historically been last to receive attention to the, for the parks, sidewalks, lighting, and streets. And then we had another great thing happen. A collaborative health professionals applied for and received a national level grant that's a collaborative of some of the largest foundations in the country to bring health services to the citizens of this neighborhood. This two and a half year grant that has potential for a second um, granting and for, for to make five years will bring over $800,000 worth, worth of services in the area of health, food scarcity, and uh, transportation to our neighborhood, all to be sent through Doyle as the conduit for these services. This grant is only happening because of support from Peterson Health and several other partners who <laughs> recognize the dire need of the citizens of the, of the Doyle neighborhood relative to health care services, food scarcity, and the need for transportation. There's seven partners in our project, and for the National uh, Build Health Organization, we are the largest collaborative in the smallest community that they have across the country. This grant rounds out Doyle services that have always included strength in education, senior services, and community building to include more breadth and depth of services in health and food equality. The grant also um, enables Doyle to add employees, including a project manager, health navigator, community health worker, and driver. The Stevens Foundation recently funded an outreach coordinator. These positions add to the ones already at Doyle, which are a part-time facility managers, two part-time kids club coordinators, and a half-time custodian. Several of these employees actually live in the Doyle neighborhood. Our current programs include the community gatherings such as Blue Santa, Back to School Bash, Back the Blue Gatherings, and National Night Out. Twice a month, senior citizen luncheons, educational programs such as Money Matters, and after school and summer kids clubs happen. These programs, again, um, have attendance of just over a thousand people each year. Now with the additional services through Hope for Health, Hope for Health, which is the, what we call our, our local Build Health um, collaboration, Doyle will serve more people. We'll have health screenings. We'll navigate people to medical homes. We'll have transportation to access medical services outside the neighborhood, and nutrition programs will increase the Doyle neighborhood citizens' ability to live healthier and more productive lives. Economically, the data shows that there is a greater incidence of infant mortality, chronic illness that goes untreated, and under, and under or non-insured individuals in this area of Kerrville than in other areas. Educationally, there are more people who did not complete high school than any other part of the county. It is difficult to believe that one of the oldest, most historically relevant parts of Kerrville that sits close to the middle of the city has gone under the radar and been left out of some important services since integration. The fact of integration should have helped solve the problem, but an unintended consequence was that it really exacerbated it because many of the services moved out of the neighborhood so that the people of the neighborhood did not have as easy access to the services. No longer were there grocery stores, restaurants, and doctor's in offices in the neighborhood. So raising the level of health care, taking people to services outside the neighborhood, giving access to food with twice monthly food banks, educational programs that fill in gaps that make better employees, not only meets the criteria of quality of life grant request, but we believe it will also raise up the skills and assets of the workforce 
but it seems like if I can understand what everyone was talking about, that's a, a big need here. Um, who live in the area that, that would be able to access these programs. So we come to you to ask for help to renovate this, this aging building. For almost 10 years, the Doyle Board has worked to improve the lives of the neighborhood, walking alongside and giving a hand up rather than a hand out. During this time, the building has aged to a point that is almost beyond that tipping point of sustainability. We propose to make changes to the building that will improve the efficiency and safety of the building, create more effective use of space, and maintain the historical integrity of the structure. We have been planning for a renovation for about five years and have had a very kind and generous gift of time and talent from Peter Lewis and Carson Conklin of J.M. Lowe. So we do have schematics and drawings and some estimates that we will show you today. Just to show you a little bit about the way funding happens at Doyle and how we've managed to do what we've done and can, will continue to, the Build Health Grant has directed some funds for renovation within, the, within that grant. It's not enough to do everything we need to do, but there is some money in the Build Health Grant, primarily directed toward the HVAC system in the kitchen. There's also funds to improve technology in the building. This grant will pay for staffing mentioned that, that I've mentioned earlier, but also if the building improvements, technology, and setting up office spaces in Doyle. And then meanwhile, Doyle has already increased and already has funding for increased hours of the facility manager and to continue the kids club um, staffing, kids club staff and the custodian. We also have, have already um, budgeted and have funds for the utilities, maintenance, and lawn care, which we've been doing for almost 20 years with grants from the Peterson Foundation in the city and fundraised money. The project manager for Hope for Health has already identified $200,000 more funding that we can apply for now that we have, have the staffing to, to support that. Recently, the Perry and Ruby Stevens Charitable Foundation granted Doyle $200,000 for building renovations. Additionally, a grant request to the Hal and Charlie Peterson Foundation is under review. This would bring an additional $200,000 towards the renovation. I'll be meeting with them for the second time next week. So the most current estimates for the renovations are separated into two phases. There are a phase three and four that we haven't even begun to talk about for the, out, for the outside part of the, the, the facility. We've divided the two phases into above ceiling and below ceiling. All of these items, again, will improve security, efficiency, and the historical integrity of the building. Some of the issues that are occurring now for Doyle have to do with the constant repurposing done during the time KISD owned the building. We have lots of disabled fire alarms, um, bells, you know, anything that a school would need is, is still there and, and unusable. Uh, the HVAC system is simply old and inefficient. We've, we have nursed it along, but of the three units, the, the newest one was installed in 1994. The building's temperature is almost never completely comfortable, whether it's hot or cold outside. The kitchen and dining areas are essential to the, to the um, success of the Hope for Health program. There has never been a complete commercial kitchen in Doyle, as the district always delivered meals to this school, or when it was the uh, Afri school for African American children, the kids actually went home for lunch in those days. The biggest issue is that the front entrance uh, was removed and made into storage, so there is no central entrance, which hinders the ability for us to have a secure building. The, the, uh, the many doors make it difficult to monitor, and uh, the front door in Barnett Street would be reestablished and the other doors made to be locked in, 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 so that they would only be for egress. Um, you may have noticed if you've been over there that our historical marker is actually kind of in an odd place, that's because that's where the entrance is supposed to be. And so that's why we put the historical marker there. The rest of phase two will make the restrooms uh, accessible and ADA com compliant and would complete the rewiring of the building along with some aesthetic improvements. So we have some slides of the rendering, of the um, schematics and renderings to show you. Um, and, um, you know, these are ones that Peter Lewis has done to, to help us out. 
I don't know if there's really any questions about, about the drawings. It's a long, narrow shotgun school, kind of. Um, and so that's the grounds. And then we've got, th these are the schematics. Um, there will be a few changes based on the, because these were done before the Hope for Health um, project started um, or was gained. And so we will have to make a few small changes to the, to the schematics to have the healthcare uh, clinic and, and that sort of thing in there. Your first picture shows parking lots that don't exist, are they? Do those parking lots exist? Uh, ish. Sort of. Ish, ish. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <clears throat> You're yeah. going to formalize the, uh, the parking. Yeah, the one on the, the um, Webster, yeah. Webster yeah. Is, um, is actually where there were some portable buildings during the kindergarten years, I think, is what, is what that is, and then it became a parking lot. Um, and then, is, are there any questions about the schematics? It's fairly simple. It's getting it closer to the historical setup that it had when it was the school for the African American children. And then, that's without our unruly bushes in front. Um, so, I have a lot of the board members here, and thank you all for coming. And neighborhood um, members of the neighborhood are here to to support this project. Um, Peterson Health is, is here to, to say that they're all in, and they are. I've been amazed. I mean, it's to be a hometown purse girl and to see Peterson Health still giving back to the community like they were set up to do. Because my mom would always tell me, they're, you know, they're here to help, you know. And so I, it, it really is fun for me as, to, to see that as a native pavilion. Um, on behalf of the Doyle School Community Center Board of Directors, I do want to thank you for your commitment to being <coughs> such good stewards of the, the tax monies. Um, sales tax. Um, we know that we know that you, we are one of many who come to you uh, with sound reasoning and a passion for the work we do. Um, we hope that our appeal has been able to show you that the very criteria for quality of life projects is met well in this proposal. The hub that the Doyle Center provides and the help it gives its citizens is critical to the well-being of, of that neighborhood. But the fact that simply renovating a building that will provide these services will raise not only the quality of life of the Doyle citizens, it will also contribute citizens that can help the job, job force, it will give leaders to Kerrville, which are needed, um, and it will just in general enhance people's quality of life that will turn into better workers and better citizens for Kerrville. Um, the ripple effect of improving the quality of life of some will, con will continue out into the economy and services of Kerrville. So thank you. Do you have any questions? Who owns the building now? Calus? Or do y'all own the building? The, our not, not non-profit owns the building. Non-profit owns the building. Mm -hmm. They just gave it to them. <coughs> yes. So in phase one, you called that above the ceiling, ceiling and above. Mm -hmm. um, if you get the other two uh, funds, um, you've got one, you're, you're looking for the other. Would our funding then finish the entire project? You had mentioned phases three and four. Um, so kind of give me an idea. This rendering that's right in front of us, is that through phases one and two, or is that a phase further down the line? That's what you would see with the fancy parking lots would be three and four. So the parking yeah. lots plus the building are Correct. all Everything, the way through four Right, phases. the, the eight, 800,000 that we're seeking right now, which would be 200 from Stevens, 200 from Peterson, and 400 from EIC, that would enable us to do all the interior work. And, um, you know, we've, we've had some real good fortune with having help on the outside of the facility, so we feel like we can, can maintain um, kind of what we're doing with programmatically outside um, and then work on getting phase three and four at, a, at another, another time. So what are phases three and four three in and detail, four. and then what are they dollars? <laughs> um, in dollars, I will have to refer to my notes. I think it's about another... Four hundred thousand. Who's the money's person? Is that correct? Um, and it's most of that is that big pavilion. It needs some some rehab. Um, there, there's also a parking lot, and I believe I, uh, Chief Smith could tell me more if, and help me understand this more. But it also has to do with um, how the I believe it brings a different type of water 
system to the building to, to enhance the fire suppression system that we'll be putting in in the first two phases. Is that, okay. I believe that's correct. But a lot of it is on that pavilion. And that is, you know, that's used all the time because our building doesn't have to be open for the pavilion to be used. So you'll, you'll go by there many, lots of times in the evening and see people out there playing basketball or soccer or, or, or things like that. So do you need the parking facilities as you, you have depicted them? Uh, finished to that degree to to offer the services that you're offering um, and if so how much for that and then if the fire suppression system needs to be upgraded what what's the number there do you have that am I asking questions you're asking hard questions to I'm answer? not prepared to answer okay. I never thought uh, to study my three and four um, phases um, Judy do you have a, does anybody have that reference or no okay yeah, Chief Smith would have, yeah, <laughs> right, um, um, the, I don't think I have it actually, hang on, yeah, I'm not prepared to answer that, okay. uh, but the parking, we believe that we can, 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 can make do with the parking situation as it is, and do this project, do, be able to serve the needs of this, the community through, on Hope for Health, and um, all the other things that we do. Um, we were really trying to stay focused on the most essential to provide the services. Okay. So, but the, to do all of the above ceiling and, and below ceiling um, on the interior, we would need the, um, the 400,000 plus the matching 400,000 from the foundations and community plus the, it's about 95 to 100,000 that's in the uh, Build Health Grant that's also geared to the renovations. So. And programmatically, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sure you partner with it, all the logical partners in town already, like Kerr Connect and everything for transportation to doctors. Yes. So when I was registering voters door to door in Doyle several years ago and just talking to people, that was one of the biggest problems, particularly with the elderly. With the transportation. Yeah. Exactly. And that's why it, I mean, really, all of the other built health grants in the in the nation mm -hmm. picked either food scarcity, transportation, or uh, medical homes as their focus. You know, Kerrville people, they just said, we're going to do them all. And so the way we're doing the transportation is uh, with the assistance of Kerr Connect, but our, with the difference that our, ours would be an employed person instead of a volunteer okay. as theirs are. Okay. Hey, how long has the nonprofit <laughs> existed? Um, it was, I think 2003 was the, the year that the 501c3 was approved. And then when did y'all acquire the building? Uh, it was right 2004. Okay. Okay. Did you? Yeah. I've got the founding, founding fathers here, so I'm pretty, pretty fortunate. So it looks like y'all, if I'm reading it correct, the operating expenses currently are a little shy of a hundred thousand dollars a year. They, that's that's the that's what we're gearing up to. We've asked for uh, with the Stevens money, and um, then what we'll be getting from Peterson Foundation for the operations part of our grant request. Um, we are just now exceeding. We've been about forty-five to fifty thousand before the Stevens grant um, came in. So then that puts us up to that. Are, are those grants multi-year grants or one year at a time? Um, Peterson is one year at a time, but they renewed year after year, year over year, you know, for I think at least six to eight years, six or eight years. Um, Stevens, um, I think we will have to find that money elsewhere because they don't generally fund operations. That was a real exception that they made mm -hmm. in our for this year for this startup. And on the, the Hope for Health grant, you said that is that for two and a half years? It is. And is that something that is re potentially renewable? It is. Okay. Who, who funds it? Um, if you can think think of every national foundation, um, and they're probably in it, the Kellogg Foundation, the Beaumont Foundation, it's, it's, a, a, it's a huge collaborative okay. of foundations. I'm sorry? Methodist Health Ministries. Methodist Health Ministries, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Doesn't sound like it. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. All right. So our next step is probably to have some further discussion.
um, about the project and the details and so on and so forth. So, uh, and then of course we know what to do with regard to what to ask for from that standpoint. So, um, I would say when we move into the executive session, which is going to be in the next step, we probably want to add this. There's three that were already on the agenda to be in executive session, but if we could add that. And just cite good. the section related to the uh, business development application. Mm -hmm. All right. So that takes us through item number three, and item number four is executive session. And I will be looking for a motion for the four items. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I move we go into executive session to discuss the airport improvements, the Skymaster project, the property that EIC owns uh, on Peterson Farm Road, and now the Doyle Community Center. Okay, so that would be under section section 551.071.087. They are all, I think, covered there. Yeah. 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 That's it. I'll second the motion. Have a motion and a second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. We are moving into executive session. It is 4.52. <laughs> all right, we're coming back into regular session. It's 5.01. Um, we do have three other things in executive session to deliberate. <coughs> Uh, we're going to go back in there and do that. So we, we thought since your ask was today, we would come back out. And uh, we were hoping your crowd was still here. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, again, to to have conversation uh, further about, about your request. So, motion? I'll make a motion that we initiate a funding agreement discussion with the city uh, to move forward with your request. And... Uh, and it's set for a public hearing on March the 9th. A second. March the 9th or is it the 16th? 16th. March 16th. Oh, March 16th. Yeah. Well, so March 16th. Well, I thought it was around the corner. <laughs> yeah. I don't know That's our week, next uh, a weekly next meeting. meeting. meeting we'll March the 16th. All right. We have the motion. Do we have a second? Second. Motion and second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. All right. It passes unanimously. And thank you very much. Thank you. It was a great presentation. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Very nice. All right. It is 5 okay. It is 5 2 We're going to move back into executive session. <laughs> it's 5 39. We are back in regular session. Um, no items for discussion in this meeting coming out of executive session. Any items for future agendas? Anyone? All right. Anybody have an announcement? None of that. <laughs> Very good. So, meeting is adjourned. <laughs>